I believe, I believe that uh, Canada's greatest need actually is unskilled workers. It's not um, skilled uh, people. So are there, how are we doing on the screens? It's not, not, there's not much, uh, you're having the same problem I'm having. I, I don't feel bad now. I actually, our one little issue is it never got emailed to us. So we're just uh, trying oh. to get it. Oh, no, no problem. Well, the slides actually were just uh, the story of uh, Afghanistan. The, Afghanistan is a, is a regular country, normal people. Um, and, you know, women were getting educated, women could work, and uh, all of a sudden they were abandoned, and uh, the Taliban took over, and now women can't work, and women can't go to school, and there's even a genocide going on of the Hazara population of um, Afghanistan. It's absolutely horrific. For those people who are not familiar with uh, 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 Afghanistan, a lot of people tend to think that refugees live in tents, in camps, and that's how they live. When you see the pictures of Afghanistan, like this is, it's a normal city, just like Waterloo. It's, it's not much different. That's how most of the people um, live. So in my ease into Canada refugee program, I've had about 200 refugees through the program, about 50 or 60 of those would be refugees that I sponsored. The other hundred to change would be wow. refugees that come through other um, people. The, Pandemic set back the refugees because they tended to be the low people on the totem pole. And many of them were involved in hospitality industry, dishwashers and that type of thing. And so uh, many of them lost their job early in the pandemic. And fortunately right now we've basically back up to full employment. And as, as you know, if you, if you wanna work in Canada, there's lots and lots of jobs available. So are there questions I can answer? I know it's a little early for questions, but let's uh, answer questions. I don't have any right now, but I, I have a really good question for you based on where we're at right now. Um, so I, I know that when you started uh, bringing in uh, and connecting with, uh, the, with refugees and newcomers, you put people in many different sorts of positions. Um, I uh, Saurabh was saying that, you know, you have labor positions who, who some of those people are refugees, but you also can move people into the office. So did, how did your organization benefit as a whole when you decided that it was going to be across the board and not just in one skill category versus another skill category? Well, well, clearly the people you bring in, some of them are laborers and some of them are accountants and some of them are IT people and whatnot. So people want to be placed more or less where their skill level is. At the same time, when we bring people in, we, we try to talk down their expectation. So some people, like I, I brought in one person, he's a geologist, an oil drilling geologist. Well, you're in Guelph, you're not gonna drill for oil in Guelph and we don't need any geologists. What else might you be able to do? So talk down the expectation. I've had people reach out and say, uh, I, I'd like to uh, manage your, uh, you know, your factory. I get that you'd like to manage your factory, my factory, but uh, management jobs, you have to have Canadian experience and background and culture, and you maybe need to speak English better and that kind of stuff. Um, so the Ease into Canada program is a uh, labor, we're doing light remanufacturing where anybody can do the job, but the key focus on that is to try to figure out where people should ultimately be placed. And I've had, I had one doctor go through that program even because the purpose is to learn English. So the purpose is to learn English and then, uh, and then figure out what your future path is. I've had doctors through, I've had lawyers through, I've had IT people, I've had accounting. Um, as far as placement rate goes, we've had 100% success rate with engineers, accountants, pharmacists are in high demand. Pharmacy, it takes about two to three years of pretty hard study to get certified in Canada. But most of the pharmacists are thrilled to work as a, a clerk at, in, a, in a pharmacy, Costco or, uh, uh, you know, the, the corner pharmacy for a couple of years while they get uh, their credentials. And if you get your credentials as a pharmacist, you, you almost write your ticket. Like that's, that's $100,000 a year job and there's tons of jobs in that. Um, 
accountants we we have good luck with the people we've had more difficult oh anything anyway anything blue collar totally easy if you're work construction or if you're willing to work in a factory or uh if you're willing to work in fast food if you're willing to work uh uh and those are the jobs there's an unlimited number of there's so many of those jobs that some jobs i won't even i don't even tell people about because i don't like the company that much and don't think that their jobs are that good at jobs but uh if you're willing to work uh, in a factory, um, doing landscaping, agriculture, there's tons and tons of, uh, there's a real shortage of people. Um, so uh, people tend to be a little lower um, in their placement to where they might've been in, in um, when they were in Syria or where Afghanistan or whatever. So, uh, I mean, I have one person working in accounting now, and he, he would have been, you know, more of an accounting uh, manager, not a CFO controller type in, in our organization. He's, you know, in accounts payable, so it's it's um, more clerical. But I also tell people you're starting at the bottom, you work your way up just like the next people, and as you do it, you'll do it. And I've had a lot of really good success stories. Uh, it adds good diversity to the uh, to the whole company. So. Can you share one of those stories? Because I always love a good story, Jim. Well, um, one, one of my favorite, I, I shouldn't have favorites, but one of my employees that I love is an IT person. And he basically started um, in the factory and he's had a little bit of an IT background. He's taken all his Microsoft certification courses, taking all the courses. He's now one of my best IT people. And that's who I call when I'm trying to set up my new laser printer. And that's what that's. And so that's one success story story. Um, another success story is um, uh, Ahmed Abed and his wife Rula opened a sock store in downtown uh, Guelph. And uh, the business has done okay through COVID. It's not that good through COVID, but they've survived through COVID. And the store has been open for about three years. And uh, so there, and, and he works full-time in my factory. She works full-time in the, uh, the sock store. And uh, he works on the evenings and weekends, so it's uh, um, but that's a successful business um, startup with lots of funny stories around it. When he when he was opening, um, I went in while they were prepping to open, and he has his box for twenty dollars. You're not going to be able to sell socks for twenty dollars. He's oh, that's okay. They can talk me down to three dollars. It's like. Uh, no, this is Canada. That's not the way we're going to roll here. And, and the other thing he had is at the entrance, he had all of what we would call really gaudy, glittery stuff. I'm saying, you're not going to sell a tablecloth with all this glitter on it. Like, yes, you can have that. You put that at the back. But what people here want is earth, tone, like just soft, cream colored, uh, boring. That's what you want to sell to Canadians. Uh, so, uh, Another So one of the things when we get people and we do the safety training, um, my experience with the Syrians particularly is they, you really have to be careful with them because they don't like safety rules. So we have a safety shoe rule and the guy shows up with flip flops. It's like, where's your safety shoes? He says, oh, don't worry. If I hurt my foot, it's my prop. Don't, don't, you don't have to worry about it. Well, of course, you know, that's not the way we work in Canada. I, I don't think that uh, whoever investigates workplace safety is going to be happy if I said, oh, yeah, no problem. The guy just wears flip flops because he wants to. And uh, same thing with uh, all kinds of disobeying of safety rules, because, oh, we can save time by uh, not walking between the lines where the forklifts go. We'll, we'll watch for the forklifts. Don't worry. Well, no, we're not going to watch for the forklifts. We're going to walk where, where the walkway is, where you're supposed to walk. Uh, leads me to a really great uh, secondary question is, you know, where have those challenges been? Like, say I'm a new employer and I'm thinking I'd like to partake in a program like this. I'd, I'd like to maybe start a program like this if I'm really ambitious. Where were those challenges along the way that you saw, um, whether it was getting stuff set up or I know we've talked before about some of the social aspects like housing and things like that. Like where were those really big challenges that you would identify in trying to um, either work with the program uh, at, the, at the federal level or try to make it happen on the ground? So my big frustration at the federal level is speed. They're very, very slow. And the problem as an employer, I have uh, 12 openings in my factory today. 
I can't hire 12, like if you start the process today, it's nine months, but it might be a year and it might be a year and a half. Very tough for an employer to do any planning when you know it's a year and a half out. It works better for the, the larger employees, uh, employers. That's where the EMPP program works. So if you, you know you're gonna need hundred people to go through the EMPP, you can hire um, skilled or semi-skilled uh, people if you know that sometime next year, but if you need them on Monday, it doesn't do that. So the speed of the government is a big frustration to me. It's a particularly a big frustration right now because uh, with the Afghan refugee situation, they said they would bring in 40,000 refugees. We said we would sponsor 300 of those. This would have been six months ago. They said you can sponsor 10. Oh. You were given 10 out of 300. And um, so the speed, um, and, and they're still letting us know. And the other thing is the government, when you're a saw, they give you spaces and all the saw, not, we haven't been given our spaces. None of the saws have been given the spaces. And so it's sort of all in limbo right now. Of course, once you arrive, um, I learned that learning English is more difficult than I thought it was. When I immigrated to Canada, I didn't speak any English and I was actually illiterate, but it, didn't, it wasn't a hard for me. For some reason, I picked it up pretty easily. Of course, I was nine months old, but um, the um, so learning English is a little more difficult than I thought. I do am a big believer in uh, workplace English because many people, they're not academic. You put them in a classroom, you can go to a class for a whole year and not learn English unless you apply yourself. A workplace, you, you get a little bit more because you're you're conversational with people um, and, and we customize it a little more. We assign a, an English coach and decide that this person should be watching this television show and reporting on that. This person should be uh, um, you know, joining a tea circle and, and uh, doing a walk and talk and whatnot. So we assign uh, English homework, a little bit of tough love around that. And the other problem we always have is, uh, is the pure logistics and housing in Guelph. It, it, like we do it the same way if you were moving to Guelph, we go on to Kijiji and find out what's available, but uh, prices are so high. It's so tough to get uh, appropriate accommodations. Um, and I don't know if that's one we could solve, except with money, I hate to say it, like uh, we pay the price just like everybody else. We, we got a question, <laughs> so not just my questions and my, me wondering. Um, thanks, Jim. Given your amazing accomplishments, you must have an amazing HR team to support hiring newcomers. For a small or medium-sized business, what kind of a commitment can one expect to acquire, what, what kind of commitment can one expect to acquire new Canadian employees? And what kind of gaps have you experienced um, in resources, yeah. Uh, yeah, resource out there to support, in resources out there to support your effort. So I will say, if you give someone a chance, you will end up with your most loyal employee. Hardworking, they'll do anything for you because people need the chance. So that's the plus side. The negative side, there is some cultural things. One thing I'd learned in the Ease Into Canada program, with almost everybody, we had to have a conversation. Your shift starts at eight, that means you're here at eight or 7.55. You're not here at 8.30. And that's because um, um, overseas, the, uh, as a matter of, the, the sock store, I got a call from the uh, owner of the mall saying sock store is not open at uh, 11 o'clock. At least says they're supposed to be open mall hours, which start at 10 and whatnot. And say, why aren't you open? Well, nobody ever shows up before uh, 11.30. So why should we open? Like they're, they're so we, we do coach around the time. Um, English is, uh, is always an issue. And the way things are done culturally here is somewhat different. Um, but I will, I will say that people are good. They're educated. They'll try hard. Um, it is a little easier if you have more people because uh, even with us, we, we still have a one in 10 failure rate, I'm going to call it. So the problem is if you hire one and that's a failure, then, then it's, it's a little tougher for you. Now, we did all of the settlements. So we, did, we picked them up at the airport. We moved them in the apartment. You don't have to do that. You can call, you can post jobs at immigrant services and you can hire someone who's already here, already in their apartment. It's not your responsibility to, uh, 
move them in or look at look at doing any of that. I did another reason I did the ease into Canada program is the first 90 days, there's actually quite a few appointments that take them away from work. The, the simplest would be, well, they have to move into their apartment, but it's doctor's appointments, it's dentist appointments, it's appointments with immigrant services, it's um, appointments, it's just appointments. And, and so when I would refer people too soon to another business, not all businesses are flexible to say, yeah, I understand you haven't been to a dentist in five years, so you have three dentist appointments in the next um, six weeks and you now and you have another doctor's appointment because you have to do this doctor's appointment. Now, it, it's just a, a few more appointments um, and some of those need to be done uh, during work hours. But I tell you, once people understand what you want, I have hugely super high loyalty and um, work ethic that I wish some of the Canadian employees would have. Uh, we have another question. So this is from Samir Dogra. So if I said your name wrong, I apologize. Um, HR manager from Toyota Gose. I need to understand which government organization can help the private organizations to get refugees on board. It's a very interesting company um, up more in the northern part of Wellington. So what sort of uh, organizations can help do that? Well, uh, IRCC is the main governing uh, body, but um, uh, immigrant services, there's immigrant services in different uh, municipalities they are given contracts from the government to be the, uh, I know in uh, Waterloo, it's, uh, I forget the name of the, the one in Waterloo, but it's different, different people, uh, different organizations in different places. So I would find who your um, immigrant services equivalent is in your geographic area to find that out. Um, now, the, the key when you sponsor through a SAW, when a refugee arrives in Canada, they're self-determining. So when they, we sponsored uh, two people who came to Canada, they didn't settle in Guelph. One of them moved to Vancouver. One of them moved to London to be with family. So once they come here, you, you, they're, they're not limited where they stay and they're not, and you can't force them to work in your factory either. Um, the other uh, program, IMPP, it is an employment program. You interview them usually through WhatsApp or Skype before they arrive. Um, you explain what the work is, you agree to hire them, and, uh, and then it's like hiring a, a regular employee that shows up on a, a certain date. You do also have to arrange with an organization, or you can do it yourself, to do the settlement, which is all the stuff I've talked about, picking them up and finding the housing and stuff like that. I am trying to get that program greatly expanded. Uh, I told the government, if they could expand that program, I would personally sponsor 10,000 Hazara refugees. Hazara is a, um, well, it, it's a sect that's being genocided right now in uh, um, Afghanistan. Um, it's a visible minority. They look uh, Mongol or Chinese, and uh, it's not the first time the Hazaras have been subject to uh, this genocide. But what I want the government to do is allow us to bring in unskilled, because I can get the larger companies to commit to 50 and 100 employees, it's really tough for a smaller business because if I said, oh, great, we'll bring someone in for you, they might be here in six months. Oh, but it could be a year and a half. It could be two years. Well, you can't keep the position open for two years where I know I could go, if they'll do un completely unskilled, I'm highly confident I could get McDonald's to take 100, and Tim Hortons and, and uh, Starbucks and some of the bigger companies, Linamar Machines. Um, I've already had Chapman Ice Cream say they would take um, 50 or whatever. So I can get bigger companies to take quantities and bigger companies can do a little easier with not an immediate hire. Can you just remind us what the IMPP program is, just what the initials are, just in case someone goes looking for it? I, you know, I should know that off the top and I don't even know. So, uh, Sorab, do you know what that is? Sorab knows a lot about this. Sorry, yeah, I just, I'm looking at your slide now. It has the initials, unfortunately, not the full one, but I can look it up. Okay. <laughs> um, so someone's saying this may not be a fully appropriate question, but uh, someone likes how you just pointed out that the work ethic um, and how incredible newcomers are compared to the typical Canadian job seeker. And, and this is not something new we hear. We hear the typical job seeker versus other groups. 
Um, and I, sorry, I lost the question. So um, how can you promote this to employers so it registers with them? Um, they're saying they're finding it really hard to have employers see the positives in hiring newcomers and refugees because of that lack of Canadian work experience. Um, and that's a phrase I've heard uh, in these conversations for 20 years, Jim, is that lack of Canadian work experience or the language barrier, which are things, but they're things that we can conquer. So how do we start uh, shifting that, you know, work ethic you can't teach? Well, I mean, part of it is uh, I am an employer and I look first to the person and the attitude because I don't think I can change attitude much and I can train on the skills. So one technique I've used successfully is I have someone go through my Easy into Canada program and she's an architect. I call an architect firm and I say, would you give her a chance for 90 days? She's still learning English. She obviously doesn't know the Ontario building code um, as well as she should yet. Um, and I say, would you hire, give her a chance for 90 days, pay her minimum wage. And you know what happens after 90 days, you, you, you work into a real job. I have an electrical engineer who uh, started that way. He worked his first year at Linamar as a machine that's like on, on a machine, really tough shift work. And now he's an electrical engineer making electrical engineer salary um, for an electrical engineering um, company. So what I try to do is just open the door and sort of give it a try. You give it a try and most employers, uh, it's not that easy to hire right now. It, 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 we are in a, we're almost in a position of full employment. The people that wanna work uh, can get a job. And if you walk around the city, you'll see lots of help wanted. You, everybody's trying to hire. Well, and for that matter, minimum wage has almost become meaningless. Like I, I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't even hire anybody for minimum wage. I, I, should, I should say I hire, I pay more than minimum wage. I didn't want people to misinterpret that and say I pay less. <laughs> you know what, that's, that's a conversation we keep hearing as well. You know, um, in the past, whenever minimum wage was gonna go up, there was, always a, there was always a response from businesses. And this time around, there really wasn't because so many now were paying 16, $17 an hour that 15 didn't really make much, much sense at this point. Um, because they were already budgeting higher uh, on that. Um, so let's say I'm an employer and I don't want to go the EMPP road exactly, but I still want to tap into, um, you know, um, the talent pool. And I still want to, you know, some of us are looking at our diversity, equity, and inclusion pieces. And we want to, um, you know, there's a lot to be said for diversity because it brings new thought processes to who we are and, and what we do. So, you know, maybe I don't want to go that full route just yet. Um, who else do you know in the community? You know, you mentioned Immigrant Services Wealth Wellington, that's the name you were looking for. You know, who else do you know in the community who maybe as an employer I could reach out to and say, hey, you know, I'm kind of thinking of diversifying. I'm thinking about expanding my talent pool. You know, how do I connect to those people? Can you think of some off, off the top of your head that... So not specifically. Not specifically around immigrants, but they do a lot of immigrants is Luther Wood and Second Chance in Guelph. But again, there are organizations like Luther Wood and Second Chance in every municipality. Um, and these, the advantage of employees that come through those organizations, they often come with um, some sort of subsidy so that they, they know what the government programs are and they will uh, hire people. So many of them are retraining um, off of one position to another position. Uh, immigrant services is good. The other thing is uh, I would just advertise the way you advertise now on Indeed. And if you get someone who doesn't have the Canadian experience, if you give people an opportunity, the gratitude will pay back is my personal experience. Um, and I, I guess we also need employees. Like, I, I don't think there's anyone here who's saying, well, gee, I get 100 applications for a job anymore. That's not the way. It, that's not the way it's working in my experience. I'm trying to hire even another dozen employees. It's like, uh, gee, did we get 18 resumes? And you know, it's it, it's almost gotten to the point where I, I was teasing with a friend and saying, uh, so when you're interviewing, you say, so well, how bad was that criminal thing? You didn't really want to do it, and like, it, 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 you didn't hit him really hard. It was just soft, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> Yes, I think it was a meme on something close to that. Uh, but uh, someone's asked, you know, in terms of that sort of 90-day promotion, 90-day program, 
how do you prepare your staff to cope with the influx of newcomers? Like, okay, we're gonna bring somebody on, you know, that were there challenges associated with the staff um, accepting it, shifting, coping that you so, saw so, or that you've heard? So I did it all with uh, volunteer staff and I asked staff who'd be willing to help with the program. And I didn't pay um, and I got volunteers and I call it a team building exercise. So what we did is we have uh, English lunch buddies. Would you be willing to have lunch with uh, someone? Uh, and, and you see the problem I had when I first started, of course, we would have, you go into the lunchroom, there'd be five tables of Arabic speaking and then five tables of English speaking. And by mixing it up, then you're naturally gonna start speaking some English and whatnot. So it's simple things like that. I found very high volunteerism in my company and people like doing the right thing. People feel good about it. Um, I had a truck driver who drove every single Saturday and Sunday for like 10 weeks in a row on his own time, not, not being paid. And that's picking up furniture, delivering furniture, moving into, and that's because I don't let other people drive my truck. So it had to be one of our truck drivers. And he's more inspired working for the company, even though he's working 60 hours a week or something and only getting paid for 40 because he's uh, he's helping out. So I call it, I tell my business friends, it can be a team building exercise to rally around and support people. I have not had much negative pushback at all, really, from this. Um, I think we're fortunate that we're in Canada. When I first did the refugee program, I did have some hate, a lot of hate emails and hate comments on the um on the articles and stuff like that. But when you analyze it, a lot of that came from uh, down, down south, which unfortunately I have factories down there too. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not good. But. I like that. I like that you just changed the marketing of it. You know, like it's, it's pretty much what you did. You just marketed it better to your staff and, and shifted the, the wording on it to help figure things out. Uh, Kaylee Lee from Atlantic Limited, uh, Atlantic Industries Limited was wondering, you mentioned there were some cultural difference you had to overcome relating to safety mindsets. So what strategies did you engage with to help overcome this while keeping risk of hazards low? Like you're right, last thing I want is WSIB walking through my workplace and, and having some of these conversations. So, you know, what sort of strategies did you undertake with, with some of those people who were not as committed to safety because that wasn't what it was like where they had come from. So, so the, the bigger thing is you just like, normally if you hire someone with this culture, you say, this is the rule you post it and it's done. We posted the, the signs in English and Arabic and we repeat it more than once. And we, we also become, we became zero tolerance on, on safety. We also um, did not graduate people to using uh, equipment um, like we have, we have, we're fortunate. We have a lot of jobs in remand, which don't need much equipment, automated equipment. So we waited until people, we saw that they would, um, you know, use the guards and be, be safe. So we, um, waited for that because when we first started, we moved people a little too fast into using, uh, some equipment, um, that, that does run faster, you know, when you take the guards off, but that's not what we're, that's not how we're going to do it. And then, although I said it's an issue, it's not, it's, it, you, you overcome the issue. You can overcome the issue pretty easily. Um, one thing I found is uh, the refugees tend to um, be more accustomed to autocratic rule. So the boss says something, that's the rule. And I personally don't like that management style, but I will say in some cases, especially around safety, it helps. Do not step over this line because they, 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 oh, that's, you know, you're going to get fired if you step over the line. Don't, don't step over the line. That's uh, um, when you go to promote someone to management, you have to be, be careful of that autocratic style as well, though, because then you don't want someone to say, I'm the manager. So it's my way. I said it. You have to do it. No, it's not a power trip to be a manager. That's not the way we want to run our company. We want to run our company where people understand why they need to do it. And it's team Bambi. It's not... Uh, um, you know, autocratic, uh, uh, we're, we're not the military. Yeah. I, I have heard that coming from various groups. They'll, they, they, the Canadian, what Canadians tolerate from individualism to, uh, to a more collective society and being, uh, you know, managerial style, style does change a lot, um, from culture to culture and country to country. And 
in some countries you wouldn't question it and here uh, sometimes uh, even my staff push back on me and, and that's okay uh, to some extent so it's it's a it's very uh, on that um, we have a question about how how would um, new newcomers be retained after they were hired retention right now we know is a major issue for employers um, among immigrants among other populations what would be the strategies to cope with retention you, you've mentioned some um, can you elaborate maybe on some more or some other retention strategies that you personally have to keep people within your organization? So, so my, my experience is keeping immigrants is the same as keeping the regular staff, just treat them well. The question is what is well, it varies a little bit from person to person. My experience is if you know people, including knowing their name, that keeps them attached. Food is a great bonder, except in COVID, we're not doing as much food. So we used to do uh, food, uh, like, also, budgets are always limited, so I didn't always supply the food. Potluck lunch used to be the big thing, and potluck lunch, there would always be so much food left over, there was never a problem, and I love the cooking that came in uh, on those days. But it's mostly just the way you would treat any other employees. Um, just because someone's a, an immigrant or a refugee doesn't mean you, you don't have to give them raises, or you don't have to give them uh, bonuses or pay or... Uh, um, treat them well and know that, that you are in a competitive world. So they, people, everybody wants to work their way into something. Um, one thing I'll say about the refugees is there, there's a little bit more of a class of society um, and uh, classes being, uh, no, I'm an office employee. I don't work in a factory. So we have to talk down expectations where you see for me, it's, oh, you need a job. Okay, great. Go work at Tim Hortons. People, some people, it's just like, no, I, I'm a, I'm at university educated, I'll never do that. So you have to sometimes get over that. Um, I recall I hired an engineer and the first day I get him, you know, I go put on my, my vest and safety shoes and I start walking him out to the dumpster. Um, and he's like almost holding on, no, don't, what are you, what are you doing? I'm an engineer, I, I sit in the office. Well, the first thing we do is we look at wh what scrap there is because that's how you figure out what the processes are that's, and he's thinking I'm making him be the garbage man. I'm an engineer, and this is uh, so that that was one of the other um, stories. Do you get? Um, did you do some? Just this is a retention question, not necessarily connected to um, immigrants or refugees. But when when you start um, looking at retention with your organization, are your managers highly engaged in that retention as well? Like your supervisors, your oh your floor managers, like what, are, what kind of training are you giving them? What kind of supports are you giving them to make sure that, because because we always hear that, right? Pay attracts, people retain. So like, it's so important that your people help retain your other people. So I'm just wondering what you do as an organization. So it, it isn't me, it's not the company, it's all the managers. So we put, invest a lot in the managers and everything has to be done with and through people. So it's done through the frontline managers. As a matter of fact, there's people say people quit managers, they don't quit companies. And there's truth to that. So what you're doing is you're trying to encourage the managers to um, do the motivational things, treat their people right and, uh, and whatnot. Um, it's part of leading leaders. That's what we all do. Do you have anything formal in place or is it just kind of informal oh. mentoring to mentoring? Oh yeah, we have a complete uh, formal program with uh, training. Um, at, like we, we've, we hired an outside company to do uh, training of the managers and we have uh, coaches for most of the managers. And we have, uh, uh, every Tuesday this morning, nine o'clock, we have a manager meeting where there's always a, a learning. So what's the, uh, you know, what's, sometimes learning is, you know, I did one on LinkedIn, how to use LinkedIn. Like that's not necessarily management, but others are, um, uh, management. Uh, going into a pandemic, we need to learn how to communicate differently. So, uh, you know, it just became a whole different way of managing. And I will say retention is more of a problem when you're not in person and there. I used to love, I used to walk through my factories. Like I, that's what I, and I would, I would have lunch in the lunchroom with people. Now it's like, uh, I'm, I almost feel like I'm an absentee boss. I mean, I'm at home right now. Right, I'm I'm not, not I'm not even in the office. Um, I get my mail and once in a while, I, but I'm not, and, and it's just a, a safety thing. I don't think it's safe for me. I'm not as worried about me, but I, I I can't be the one that's spreading COVID through the factory by going through and shaking everyone's hand. It's not what I do. 
Um, someone's asking, are you running anything like this in your American plants? Or is this something you're really only doing in Canada? So I am only doing this in Canada. Canada has the uh, private refugee sponsorship. And so you can do it in Canada. Um, the United States does not. The United States has not been as uh, refugee or immigrant friendly. Um, and it's even more difficult with the staff. So I have to be very, I'm almost a little careful of what I say with staff because some of my American staff thought that my program was to bring in uh, terrorists. You, you know, there's Islamophobia is part of the world and it's bigger down there than it is here. So unfortunately I, I have not done, uh, not done it there. That said, we do have a number of ethnic people obviously in our, uh, in our factories haven't done it. Okay, are there any more questions? I'm, I'm just checking really quickly on the chat. I don't see any others. Just do a quick check. Um, just just for, uh, just if you are going through the chat, you'll notice that um, there's a couple of organizations that have put up some contact information. So if you're wondering who to connect with, um, there's some in the chat. Um, one question I have is, is, unless we get more questions, is, you know, um, say I'm someone at a company and, oh, and I, oh, here's a good, really good one. Actually, I will stop my question to go to this one. Uh, are there any stories to share about hiring newcomers ages 50 and over? Um, learning styles, adaptation, were there special things that need to be considered in that kind of older immigrant newcomer piece? Well, I, I learned that it's tougher to learn English uh, if you're over 50. I've learned that if you're illiterate in your mother language, it becomes almost impossible to learn English and learn it well. So I ended up with, in my mind, a couple of different levels of English. So I now accept that someone's 55 years old and illiterate, and maybe they're not going to ever be fully conversant uh, in English. Um, a, a little uh, ageist sort of like Canadians, 55-year-olds, uh, they, they really want to please and they work like there's no tomorrow. And uh, because, because they, I, it's, it's just like my, my generation and me, right? I'm just old school. Like, yeah, you have to work and you have to work hard. That's the way, uh, that's the way life is. And it's not a lot different there. I do find refugees often think they're old, younger than we do though. Maybe not 50, but 60 year olds think that they should be retiring. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not thinking that I should be retiring and uh, I'm mid 60s. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I've got another decade in me. I'm not uh, hanging it up. Very interesting. Um, did you, here's another great one. Did you have to change or update your benefits or your ERP plans to better support your new hire immigrant needs? Or did the government agencies provide robust enough assistance for them? Uh, we did not, um, we do have an EAP program as part of our benefit package. We didn't change our, our benefits. Um, when the refugees arrive, they uh, do have medical coverage the day they arrive. So they, um, they're, they're covered and then we just cover them on our, our regular uh, program. The other thing I would say is don't overthink it. You've got staff, just add some refugees to what you have. Um, one thing I, one, one issue we can have, if we have too many refugees in one company or one place, is it is natural for them to hang around together and it's not for them to speak their mother tongue together. It's natural for them not to get as integrated. And I notice that it's often the strongest English speaker becomes a spokesperson for the group and it holds down the other people, not deliberately. It's just, it's too frustrating for me to talk English. So I'll go get uh, Mohammed who speaks English well enough to do my uh, translation for me. And I also find that in families. So often when we go visit it, when I go visit a family, the, um, the best English speaker is sort of the spokesperson for the family, but that means the other people are are not necessarily getting their uh, points across. And I encourage everybody to speak English. I don't want one person in the family to speak English. The whole family has to learn English. One of the things we've learned about sponsoring is now when we contact the company, the, the people overseas, every single email we send, learn English, learn English, Duolingo, watch YouTube, 
watch uh, television. Do you think you speak English? You don't speak English well enough. And we just pound, pound, pound. And I wish I had done more of that in the first program because I had people that we had been in touch with for over a year and then they arrive in Canada, they don't speak any English. Like you knew you were coming to Canada. And so like pick it up and, and study it. My, my grandmother was always the one who didn't speak English in my family. So um, they spoke German in the home and then they realized what a mess that was when their first child went to school. So uh, that's, that's uh, not just a, night, a, a 2020s thing that goes all the way back to the 50s, I'll be honest. Um, so how do you deal with refugee holidays, religious days and Ramadan, things like oh, that? So we, we basically honor all religious holidays of all religions, um, but that doesn't mean you get two holidays. So if you're, uh, you know, it, it, I forget how many uh, holidays we have, stat holidays, maybe 10 or 12 a year. So if you're at 10 or 12, then we do uh, make allowances for that. We do have some people who attend uh, Friday prayers, which is often a two hour um, absence from work. And we simply allow people to do it it doesn't mean they work two hours less. It means they work, uh, they work till six instead of work until uh, four, like everybody else. That's, that's the way we, uh, we do it. And I've not had any problem and I've not had any problem with it when I, um, when I voice a concern. I mean, if I say to someone, listen, you're going to go, you're taking two and a half hours to go to prayers. People are upset because they don't have to work. You know, they don't. They have to work during that two and a half hours. You need to put your hours in. Everybody uh, is very uh, willing to do that. Uh, my other experience with refugees, although many of them that I brought in are uh, uh, Muslim, is just like my Canadian employees. Many of them are secular, meaning. Uh, I, I mean, I brought people in. So you want to go to the mosque? They say, Why do I want to go to the mosque? Because there's something happening. Just like all my, I, I could go by my desk as of many of my other employees and say, are you, you know, what, what are you? And they say, oh, I'm Christian. And oh, when was the last time you went to church? Well, you know, my sister was married two years ago. So I was there then. And oh, maybe, maybe I'll go for Christmas. We'll see. Yeah. So there's many, many, they, it, like you said, it comes back to the individual, right? Maybe some do things more consistently and others, like you said, are more secular. So those always play a factor. And even then, just like sometimes uh, those religious holidays become more cultural when they come to Canada than they might have been, than maybe they were when they were in their home country. So, uh, yeah, so, so on Ram Ramadan um, has a fasting period during daylight, basically. And so some of, a bunch of them approach me and say, we just want to work eight hours straight. We don't want to work. Uh, we don't want half hour break, which is law. So we also, you know, you have to balance law. Sorry. Sorry. Government says we have to give you a half hour break after five hours of work or whatever the law is. We can't allow you to work. And I know you want to work, but no, you can't work through uh, your lunchtime. Go take a walk if you don't want to eat. And we did have one case where uh, we needed to actually have uh, um, an imam speak to the person that they did need to eat because it is part of the religion that if you need to eat, then you can eat. It's not uh, so you can't have people passing out because they uh, have low blood sugar. I, I, I don't know the, the thing, just because they choose not to eat. And, and although it's fasting, it's no more fasting than what I do every day relative to uh, going to bed at night and getting up in the morning. I mean, you're, you're, you're fasting for 10 hours or 12 hours, you're not fasting. Uh, it, it's not like not eating for all of Ramadan. So I think I'm gonna give the final question. So if I'm someone in a company, you've listened to all of this, and um, maybe I want a little bit more insight. Are you open to people connecting with you or would you recommend they connect more with that community and, and figure things out from there? Uh, I, I'm open to everybody uh, um, connecting. I'm really good on LinkedIn. If you connect on LinkedIn or I'm sure she can share my, uh, Charlene can share my uh, email address. So I, I'm more than open. I do have an HR um, department and final message is just don't overthink it, just do it. It's not, uh, you're, it, it is win, win, win. It's win for Canada, it's win for your company, and it's win for uh, refugees, build, giving people a better life. My experience is Canada does not like the current wave of immigrants, and that's been our history. So we did not like the Italians coming in. We didn't like the Irish coming in. We didn't like the Jews coming in. We didn't like the Vietnamese coming in. Now you see someone 
who's Italian is like, Ooh, you're not, you, you don't even, you don't even count as, a, uh, as an immigrant. You're German, you, you don't count as, a, as, a, as an immigrant, it doesn't count, sorry. And that's the way it will be with uh, the current wave of uh, refugees and immigrants. And refugees have added a lot to Canadian um, culture. One of my mentors um, was Frank Hasenfratz, who died about a month ago. He started Linamar Machines. He was a Hungarian refugee. He lived his first two weeks in the uh, train station in Montreal before making his way to Guelph to live on a farm. And uh, he started Linamar, which now has, I don't know, 10,000 employees in Guelph. So uh, some refugees will definitely make Canada proud, help build the fabric of Canada. Thank you for that. And, and as the granddaughter of refugees on the German side, I, I fully support that message that, you know, in a couple, in a couple generations, they just become Canadian like everyone else. And suddenly they're in community positions and like, like Frank, they're running their own businesses and they just become part of that social fabric of, of our nation. So um, thank you very much, Jim Estel, today for joining us and, and talking to us. And thank you, everyone, for asking your questions. As I said, um, we, this is a recording. I started a little bit late. My apologies. But most of the content is there. Uh, I will send out uh, that recording. I will send out Jim Estel's contact information. I strongly encourage you to connect him on LinkedIn. Jim has a great quote to start my day every day on LinkedIn. Uh, to kind of get me going and remember why I do what I do. So thank you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful end of your day and you have a wonderful evening. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks all. Thank you.